The Last of the Plainsmen by Zane Grey Chapter Ten Success and Failure At last the marble in the north dimmed, the obscure gray shade lifted, the hope in the south brightened, and the mercury climbed, reluctantly, with a tyrant's hate to relinquish power. Spring weather at twenty five below zero. On April twelfth a small band of Indians made their appearance, of the dog tribe were they an offcast of the great slaves, according to Ray, and as motley, staring, and starved as the yellow knives. But they were friendly, which presupposed ignorance of the white hunters, and Ray persuaded the strongest brave to accompany them as guide northward after musk oxen. On April 16th, having given the Indians several caribou carcasses and assuring them that the cabin was protected by white spirits, Ray and Jones, each with sled and train of dogs, started out after their guide, who was similarly equipped, over the glistening snow toward the north. They made sixty miles the first day, and pitched their Indian teepee on the shores of Artillery Lake. Traveling northeast, they covered its white waste of one hundred miles in two days. Then a day due north, over rolling, monotonously snowy plain, devoid of rock, tree, or shrub, brought them into a country of the strangest, queerest little spruce trees, very slender, and none of them over fifteen feet in height, a primeval forest of saplings. Tichin Nichola, said the guide. Land of sticks little, translated Ray. An occasional reindeer was seen, and numerous foxes and hares trotted off into the woods, evincing more curiosity than fear. All were silver-white, even the reindeer, at a distance, taking the hue of the north. Once a beautiful creature, unblemished as the snow, it trod, ran, up a ridge and stood watching the hunters. It resembled a monster dog, only was inexpressibly more wild-looking. "'Oh, ho, oh, there you are!' cried Ray, reaching for his Winchester. Fuller wolf! Them's the white devil we'll have hell with!' As if the wolf understood, he lifted his white, sharp head and uttered a bark or howl that was like nothing so much as a haunting, unearthly mourn. The animal then merged into the white, as if he were really a spirit of the world whence his cry seemed to come. In this ancient forest of youthful-appearing trees the hunters cut firewood to the full carrying capacity of the sleds. For five days the Indian guide drove his dogs over the smooth crust, and on the sixth day, about noon, halting in a hollow, he pointed to tracks in the snow and called out, Egetir, Egetir, Egetir. The hunters saw sharply defined hoof-marks, not unlike the tracks of reindeer, except that they were longer. The teepee was set up on the spot, and the dogs unharnessed. The Indian led the way with the dogs, and Ray and Jones followed, slipping over the hard crust without sinking in and traveling swiftly. Soon the guide pointed again and let out a cry, Egetir, at the same moment loosing the dogs. Some few hundred yards down the hollow, a number of large black animals, not unlike the shaggy, humpy buffalo, lumbered over the snow. Jones echoed Ray's yell and broke into a run, easily distancing the puffing giant. The musk oxen squared round to the dogs, and were soon surrounded by the yelping pack. Jones came up to find six old bulls, uttering grunts of rage and shaking ram-like horns at their tormentors. Notwithstanding that, this for Jones was his accumulation of years of desire, the crowning moment, the climax and fruition of long harbored dreams. He halted before the tame and helpless beasts, with joy not unmixed with pain. It will be murder, he exclaimed. It's like shooting down sheep. Ray came crashing up behind him and yelled, Get busy. We need fresh meat, and I want the skins. The bull succumbed to well directed shots, and the Indian and Ray hurried back to camp with the dogs to fetch the sleds while Jones examined with warm interest the animals he had wanted to see all his life. He found the largest bull approached within a third of the size of a buffalo. He was of a brownish-black color and very like a large woolly ram. His head was broad, was sharp, small ears, the horns had wide and flattened bases, and lay flat on the head, to run down back of the eyes, then curve forward to a sharp point. Like the bison, the muckscox, had short, heavy limbs, covered with very long hair and small, hard hooves, with hairy tufts inside the curve of bone, which probably served as pads or checks, to hold the hoof firm on ice. His legs seemed out of proportion to his body. Two musk oxen were loaded on a sled and hauled to camp in one trip. Skinning them was but a short work, 
or such expert hands, all the choice cuts of meat were saved. No time was lost in broiling a steak, which they found sweet and juicy, with a flavor of musk that was disagreeable. "'Now, Ray, for the calves,' exclaimed Jones, and then we're homeward bound. "'I hate to tell this redskin,' replied Ray. "'He'll be like the others. But it ain't likely he'll desert us here. He's far from his base, with nothing but that old musket.' Ray then commanded the attention of the brave, and began to mingle the great slave and yellow-knife languages. Of this mixture, Jones knew but a few words. Agatir Nietzsche, which Ray kept repeating. He knew, however, meant muskox and little. The guide stared, suddenly appeared to get Ray's meaning, and vigorously shook his head and gazed at Jones in fear and horror. Following this came an action as singular as inexplicable. Slowly rising, he faced the north, lifted his hand, and remained statuesque in his immobility. Then he began deliberately packing his blankets and traps on his sled, which had not been unhitched from the train of dogs. Jacole de Chihola, he said, and pointed south. Jacole de Chihola, echoed Ray. The damned Indian said, wife sticks none. He's going to quit us. What do you think of that? His wife's out of wood. Jackaway, out of wood. And here we are, two days from the Arctic Ocean. Jones, the damned heathen, don't go back. The trapper coolly cocked his rifle. The savage, who plainly saw and understood the action, never flinched. He turned his breast to Ray, and there was nothing in his demeanor to suggest his relation to a craven tribe. Good heavens, Ray, don't kill him, exclaimed Jones, knocking up the leveled rifle. "'Why not, I'd like to know,' demanded Ray, as if he were considering the fate of a threatening beast. "'I reckon it'd be a bad thing for us to let him go.' "'Let him go,' said Jones. "'We are here on the ground. We have dogs and meat. We'll get our calves and reach the lake as soon as he does, and we might get there before.' Mm, "'Maybe we will,' growled Ray. No vacillation attended the Indian's mood. From a friendly guide, he had suddenly been transformed into a dark, sullen savage. He refused the musk ox meat offered by Jones, and he pointed south and looked at the white hunters as if he asked them to go with him. Both men shook their heads in answer. The savage struck his breast, a sounding blow, and with his index finger pointed at the white of the north, and shouted dramatically, Naza! 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 He then leaped upon his sled, lashed his dogs into a run, and without looking back, disappeared over a ridge. The musk ox hunters sat long silent. Finally, Ray shook his shaggy locks and roared, oh, "Ho ho! Jack away out of wood! Jack away out of wood! Jack away out of wood!" On a day following the desertion, Jones found tracks to the north of the camp, making a broad trail in which were numerous little imprints that sent him flying back to get Ray and the dogs. Musk oxen in great numbers had passed in the night, and Jones and Ray had not trailed the herd a mile before they had it in sight. When the dogs burst into full cry, the musk oxen climbed a high knoll and squared about to give battle. "'Calves! Calves! Calves!' cried Jones. "'Hold back! Hold back! It's a big herd, and they'll show fight.' As good fortune would have it, the herd split up into several sections, and one part, hard-pressed by the dogs, ran down the knoll to be cornered under the lee of a bank. The hunters, seeing the small number, hurried again upon them to find three cows and five badly frightened little calves backed against the bank of snow, with small red eyes fastened on the barking, snapping dogs. To a man of Jones's experience and skill, the capturing of the calves was a ridiculously easy piece of work. The cows tossed their heads, watched the dogs, and forgot their young. The first cast of the lasso settled over the neck of a little fellow. Jones hauled him out over the slippery snow and laughed as he bound the hairy legs. In less time than he had taken to capture one buffalo calf, with half the effort, he had all the little musk oxen bound fast. Then he signaled his feet by peeling out an Indian yell of victory. "'Buff, we got him!' cried Ray. "'And now for the hell of it, getting them home. I'll fetch the sleds.' You might as well down that best cow for me. I can use another skin. Of all Jones's prizes of captured wild beasts, which numbered nearly every species common to western North America, 
he took greatest pride in the little musk oxen. In truth, so great had been his passion to capture some of these rare and inaccessible mammals that he considered the day's work the fulfillment of his life's purpose. He was happy. Never had he been so delighted as when, the very evening of their captivity, the musk oxen, evincing no particular fear of him, began to dig with sharp hooves into the snow for moss. And they found moss and ate it, which solved Jones's greatest problem. He had hardly dared to think how to feed them. And here they were, picking sustenance out of the frozen snow. "'Ray, will you look at that? Ray, will you look at that?' he kept repeating. "'See, they're hunting for feed.' And the giant, with his rare smile, watched him play with the calves. They were about two and a half feet high, and resembled long-haired sheep. The ears and horn were undiscernible, and their color considerably lighter than that of the matured beasts. "'No sense of fear of man,' said the life-student of animals. But they shrink from the dogs. In packing for the journey south, the captives were strapped on the sleds. This circumstance necessitated a sacrifice of meat and wood, which brought grave, doubtful shakes of Ray's great head. Days of hastening over the icy snow, with short hours of sleep and rest, passed before the hunters awoke to the consciousness that they were lost. The meat they had packed had gone to feed themselves and the dogs. Only a few sticks of wood were left. "'Better kill a calf and cook meat while we've got a little wood left,' suggested Ray. "'Kill one of my calves, I'd starve first, cried Jones. The hungry giant said no more. They headed southwest. All about them glared the grim monotony of the Arctics. No rock or bush or tree made a welcome mark upon the hoary plain. Wonderland of frost, white marble desert, infinitude of gleaming silences. Snow began to fall, making the dogs flounder, obliterating the sun by which they traveled. They camped to wait for clearing weather. Biscuits soaked in tea made their meal. At dawn Jones crawled out of the teepee. The snow had ceased. But where were the dogs? He yelled in alarm. Then little mounds of white scattered here and there became animated, heaved, rocked, and rose to fall to pieces, exposing the dogs. Blankets of snow had been their covering. Ray had ceased his jackaway out of wood, for a reiterated question, where are the wolves? Lost, replied Jones in hollow humor. Near the close of that day in which they had resumed travel from the crest of a ridge, they descried a long, low, undulating dark line proved to be the forest of the little sticks, where, with grateful assurance of fire and of soon finding their old trail, they made camp. "'We've four biscuits left and enough tea for one drink each,' said Ray. "'I calculate we're two hundred miles from Great Slave Lake.' "'Where are the wolves?' At that moment the night wind wafted through the forest a long, haunting morn. The calves shifted uneasily, the dogs raised sharp noses to sniff the air, and Ray, settling back against a tree, cried out, Ho, ho! Again the savage sound, a keen wailing note, with the hunger of the Northland in it, broke the cold silence. You'll see a pack of real wolves in a minute, said Ray. Soon a swift pattering of feet down a forest slope brought him to his feet with a curse, to reach a brawny hand for his rifle. White streaks crossed the black of the tree trunks. Then indistinct forms, the color of snow, swept up, spread out, and streaked to and fro. Jones thought the great gaunt pure white beast the spectral werewolves of Ray's fantasy, for they were silent, and silent wolves must belong to dreams only. Oh, yelled Ray. There's green fire eyes for you, Buff. Hell itself ain't nothing to these white devils. Get the calves in the teepee and stand ready to lose the dogs, for we've got to fight. Raising his rifle, he opened fire upon the white foe. A struggling, rustling sound followed the shots. But whether it was the threshing about of wolves dying in agony, or the fighting of the fortunate ones over those shot, could not be ascertained in the confusion. Following his example, Jones also fired rapidly on the other side of the teepee. The same inarticulate, silently rustling rustle succeeded his volley. Wait, cried Ray. Be sparing of cartridges. The dogs strained at their chains and bravely bade the wolves. The hunters heaped logs and brush on the fire, which, blazing up, 
sent a bright light far into the woods. On the outer edge of the circle moved the white, restless, gliding forms. "'They're more afraid of fire than us,' said Jones. So it proved. When the fire burned and crackled, they kept well in the background. The hunters had a long respite from serious anxiety, during which time they collected all the available wood at hand. But at midnight, when this had been mostly consumed, the wolves grew bold again. "'Have you any shots left for the forty-five ninety, besides what's in the magazine?' asked Ray. "'Yes, good handful. Well, get busy.' With careful aim, Jones emptied the magazine into the gray, gliding, groping mass. The same rustling, shuffling, almost silent strife ensued. "'Ray, there's something uncanny about those brutes, a silent pack of wolves.' "'Oh!' rolled the giant's answer through the woods. For the present, the attack appeared to have been effectually blocked. The hunters, sparingly adding a little to their fast-diminishing pile of fuel to the fire, decided to lie down for much-needed rest, but not for sleep. How long they lay there, cramped by the calves, listening for stealthy steps, neither could tell. It might have been moments, and it might have been hours. All at once came a rapid rush of pattering feet, succeeded by a chorus of angry barks, then a terrible commingling of savage snarls, growls, snaps, and yelps. "'Out!' yelled Ray. They're on the dogs. Jones pushed his cocked rifle ahead of him and straightened up outside the teepee. A wolf, large as a panther and white as the gleaming snow, sprang at him. Even as he discharged his rifle right against the breast of the beast, he saw its dripping jaws, its wicked green eyes, like spurts of fire, and felt its hot breath. It fell at its feet and writhed in a death struggle. Slender bodies of black and white, whirling and tussled together, sent out fiendish uproar. Ray threw a blazing stick of wood among them, which sizzled as it met the furry coats, and brandishing another, he ran into the thick of the fight. Unable to stand the proximity of fire, the wolves bolted and loped off into the woods. "'What a huge brute!' exclaimed Jones, dragging the one he had shot into the light. It was a superb animal, thin, supple, strong, with a coat of frosty fur, very long and fine. Ray began at once to skin it, remembering that he hoped to find other pelts in the morning. Though the wolves remained in the vicinity of camp, none ventured near. The dogs moaned and whined, their restlessness increased as dawn approached, and when the gray light came, Jones found that some of them had been badly lacerated by the fangs of the wolves. Ray hunted for dead wolves and found not so much as a piece of white fur. Soon the hunters were speeding southward. Other than a disposition to fight among themselves, the dogs showed no evil effects of the attack. They were lashed to their best speed, for Ray said the white rangers of the north would never quit their trail. All day the men listened for the wild, lonesome, haunting mourn, but it came not. A wonderful halo of white and gold, that Ray called a sun-dog, hung in the sky all afternoon, and dazzlingly bright over the dazzling world of snow, circled and glowed a mocking sun, brother of the desert mirage, beautiful illusion, smiling cold out of the polar blue. The first pale evening star twinkled in the east when the hunters made camp on the shore of Artillery Lake. At dusk the clear silent air opened to the sound of a long, haunting moan. "'Oh, ho, oh, called Ray. His hoarse, deep voice rang defiance of the foe. While he built a fire before the teepee, Jones strode up and down suddenly to whip out his knife and make for the tame little musk oxen, now digging in the snow. Then he reeled abruptly and held out the blade to Ray. "'What for?' "'We've got to eat,' said Jones, and I can't kill one of them. "'I can't, so you do it.' "'Kill one of our calves?' roared Ray. "'Not till hell freezes over. I ain't commenced to get hungry. Besides, the wolves are going to eat us, calves and all.' Nothing more was said. They ate their last biscuit. Jones packed the calves away in the teepee and turned to the dogs. All day they had worried him. Something was amiss with them. And even as he went among them, a fierce fight broke out. Jones saw it was unusual, for the attacked dogs showed craven fear, and the attacking ones a howling, savage intensity that surprised him. Then one of the vicious brutes rolled his eyes, frost at the mouth, shuddered and leapt in his harness, vented a hoarse howl, and fell back shaking and retching. "'My God, Ray!' cried Jones in horror. 
Come here. Look. That dog is dying of rabies. Hydrophobia. The white wolves have hydrophobia. If you ain't right, exclaimed Ray, I seen a dog die of that once, and he acted like this. And that one ain't all. Look, Buff. Look at them green eyes. Didn't I say the white wolves would hell? We'll have to kill every dog we got. Joan shot the dog, and soon afterwards three more that manifested signs of the disease. It was an awful situation. To kill all the dogs meant simply to sacrifice his life and raise. It meant abandoning hope of ever reaching the cabin. Then to risk being bitten by one of the poisoned, maddened brutes, to risk the most horrible of agonizing deaths. That was even worse. "'Ray, we've got one chance,' cried Jones, with pale face. Can you hold the dogs one by one while I muzzle them? Oh, ho, replied the giant, placing his bowie knife between his teeth. With gloved hands, he seized and dragged one of the dogs to the campfire. The animal whined and protested, but showed no ill spirit. Jones muzzled his jaws tightly with strong cords. Another and another were tied up. Then one which tried to snap at Jones was nearly crushed by the giant's grip. The last, a surly brute, broke out into mad ravings the moment he felt the touch of Jones's hands. And writhing, frothing, he snapped Jones's sleeve. Ray jerked him loose and held him in the air with one arm, while with the other he swung the bowie. They hauled the dead dogs out on the snow, and returning to the fire sat down to await the cry they expected. Presently as darkness fastened down tight, it came the same cry, wild, haunting mourning, but for hours it was not repeated. "'Better get some rest.' said Ray. I'll call you if they come. Jones dropped to sleep as he touched his blanket. Morning dawned for him to find the great, dark, shadowy figure of the giant nodding over the fire. How's this? Why didn't you call me? demanded Jones. The wolves only fought a little over the dead dogs. On the instant Jones saw a wolf sulking up the bank. Throwing up his rifle, which he had carried out of the teepee, he took a snapshot at the beast. It ran off on three legs, to go out of sight over the bank. Jones scrambled up the steep, slippery place, and upon arriving at the ridge, which took several moments of hard work, he looked everywhere for the wolf. In a moment he saw the animal, standing still some hundred or more paces down a hollow. With the quick report of Jones's second shot, the wolf fell and rolled over. The hunter ran to the spot to find the wolf was dead. Taking hold of a front paw, he dragged the animal over the snow to camp. Ray began to skin the animal when suddenly exclaimed, "'This fellow's hind foot is gone.' "'That's strange. I saw it hanging by the skin as the wolf ran up the bank. "'I'll look for it.' By the bloody trail on the snow, he returned to the place where the wolf had fallen, and thence back to the spot where its leg had been broken by the bullet. He discovered no sign of the foot. "'Didn't find it, did you?' said Ray. "'No, it appears odd to me. The snow is so hard the foot could not have sunk.' "'Well, the wolf ate his foot, that's what,' returned Ray. "'Look at them teeth marks.' "'Is it possible?' Jones stared at the leg Ray held up. "'Yes, it is. These wolves are crazy at times. You've seen that. And the smell of blood is nothing else, mind you, in my opinion, made him eat his own foot. We'll cut him open.' Impossible as the thing seemed to Jones— and he could not but believe further evidence of his own eyes. It was even stranger to drive a train of mad dogs. Yet that was what Ray and he did, and lashed them, beat them to cover many miles of the long day's journey. Rabies had broken out in several dogs so alarmingly that Jones had to kill them at the end of the run, and hardly had the sound of the shots died when faint and far away, but clear as a bell, bade on the wind the same haunting mourn of a trailing wolf. Ho, oh, oh, ho! Where are the wolves? cried Ray. A waiting, watching, sleepless night followed. Again the hunters faced the south. Hour after hour, riding, running, walking, they urged the poor jaded poison dogs. At dark they reached the head of Artillery Lake. Ray placed the teepee between two huge stones. Then the hungry hunters, tired, grim, silent, desperate, awaited the familiar cry. It came on the cold wind, the same haunting morn, dreadful in its significance. Absence of fire inspired the weary wolves. Out of the pale gloom gaunt white forms emerged, agile and stealthy, 
slipping on velvet-padded feet closer, closer, closer. The dogs wailed in terror. "'Into the teepee!' yelled Ray. Jones plunged in after his comrade. The despairing howls of the dogs, drowned in more savage, frightful sounds, knelled one tragedy and foretold a more terrible one. Jones looked out to see a white mass, like leaping waves of a rapid. "'Pump lead into that!' cried Ray. Rapidly Jones emptied his rifle into the white fray. The mass split. Gaunt Wolf leaped high to fall back dead. Others wriggled and limped away. Others dragged their hind quarters. Others darted at the teepee. "'No more cartridges!' yelled Jones. The giant grabbed an axe and barred the door of the teepee. Crash! The heavy iron cleaved the skull of the first brute. Crash! It lamed the second. Then Ray stood in the narrow passage between the rocks, waiting with uplifted axe. A shaggy white demon snapped his jaws, sprang like a dog. A sodden thudding blow met him, and he slunk away without a cry. Another rabid beast launched his white body at the giant. Like a flash the axe descended. In agony the wolf fell to spin round and round, running on his hind legs while his head and shoulders and forelegs remained in the snow. His back was broken. Jones crouched in the opening of the teepee, knife in hand. He doubted his senses. This was a nightmare. He saw two wolves leap at once. He heard the crash of the axe. He saw one wolf go down, and the other slip under the swinging weapon to grasp the giant's hip. Jones heard the rend of cloth, and then he pounced like a cat and drove his knife into the body of the beast. Another nimble foe lunged at Ray to sprawl broken and limp from the iron. It was a silent fight. The giant shut the way to his comrade and the calves. He made no outcry. He needed but one blow for every beast, magnificent. He wielded death and faced it, silent. He brought the white wild dogs of the north down with lightning blows, and when no more sprang to the attack, down on the frigid silence he rolled his cry, Oh! Ray, Ray, how is it with you? called Jones, climbing out. Torn coat, no more, my lad. Three of the poor dogs were dead. The fourth and last gasped at the hunters and died. The wintry night became a thing of half-conscious past, a dream to the hunters, manifesting its reality only by the stark, stiff bodies of wolves white in the gray morning. "'If we can eat, we'll make the cabin,' said Ray. "'But the dogs and wolves are poison.' "'Shall I kill a calf?' asked Jones. "'Oh, when hell freezes over, if we must.' Jones found one forty-five ninety cartridge in all the outfit, and with that in the chamber of his rifle, once more struck south. Spruce trees began to show on the barrens, and caribou trails roused the hopes and the hearts of the hunters. "'Look, in the spruces,' whispered Jones, dropping the rope of his sled. Among the black trees, gray objects moved. "'Caribou,' said Ray. "'Hurry, shoot. Don't miss.' But Jones waited. He knew the value of the last bullet. He had a hunter's patience. When the caribou came out in an open space, Jones whistled. It was then the rifle grew set and fixed. It was then the red fire belched forth. At four hundred yards the bullet took some fraction of time to strike. What a long time it was! Then both hunters heard the spiteful spat of the lead. Caribou fell, jumped up, ran down the slope, and fell again to rise no more. An hour of rest with fire and meat changed the world to the hunters, still glistening. It yet had lost its bitter cold, its death-like clutch. "'What's this?' cried Jones. Moccasin tracks of different sizes, all towing north, arrested the hunters. "'Pointed north. Wonder what that means?' Ray plodded on, doubtfully shaking his head. Night again. Clear, cold, silver, starlit, silent night. The hunters rested listening ever for the haunting morn. Day again, white, passionless, monotonous, silent day. The hunters traveled on, 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 ever listening for the haunting morn. Another dusk found them within thirty miles of their cabin, only one more day now. Ray talked of his furs, of the splendid white furs he could not bring. Jones talked of his little musk ox and calves, and joyfully watched them dig for moss in the snow. Vigilance relaxed that night. Outworn nature rebelled, and both hunters slept. Ray awoke first, and kicking off the blankets, went out. His terrible roar of rage made Jones fly to his side. 
under the very shadow of the tepee where the little musk oxen had been tethered. They lay stretched out pathetically on crimson snow, stiff, stone-cold, dead. Moccasin tracks told the story of the tragedy. Jones leaned against his comrade. The giant raised his huge fist. Jack away out of wood! Jack away out of wood! Then he choked. The north wind blowing through the thin, dark, weird spruce trees moaned and seemed to sigh. Naza! 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 End of chapter 10